So I started writing proposals really um, in 1997, so a long time ago. I started writing proposals mainly because an artwork that was wanted to be, or the gallery wanted to show wasn't available. And, and there was very little time between the opening of the exhibition and, and uh, them needing some work from me. So I, th I was thinking about what the work could be, does the work have to exist? And in that way, uh, that led me to to thinking about proposals and how show, you know the kind of kernel of a show, the beginning of a show before it reaches any sort of public realm, um, how that exists. You know, how does the work? You know, the conversations that you and I have had leading up to this conversation we're about to have are, are very much in a similar way that we you know you get to know an idea or a space or a, a way of thinking. And so the proposals were very much born out of necessity, but then very quickly. I realized because of the relationship with with the typewriter, you know, if you if you uh, press a letter P with caps lock on, you get a letter P in caps lock and it's irreversible. You can't erase it. You can't change that. And so the idea quickly formed in my mind that it's it's almost a way, a sculptural way of making text. It's a, you know, it's, it's the interaction of the carbon when it's trapped between the, the key of the typewriter and the paper. And th then in that way, that then led into me thinking about how work itself can be described and how language can then lead into an interpretation of that work. And so the proposals become a way of describing artworks, but they're always descriptive. They're not prescriptive. So they describe the work in a way, hopefully, anyway, <laughs> Hopefully they describe the work in a way that allows others into the work, but then also allows them to make their own um, their own version of the work. You know, the imagined version of the work. If you're if we're all reading a Raymond Carver short story, we all bring ourselves to that short story, despite us all, you know, reading the same 15 pages of that short story. We all have a slightly different version of the house or the cabin or the characters. You know what they look like. Um, and in the same way, the proposals, they're always single sheets of A4 paper, um, office paper, very standard. Um, and one of the other reasons I started using a typewriter was really, um, uh, it was one of, uh, well, partly necessity in that uh, at the time in 1997, I couldn't afford a computer. You know, Apple computers were kind of those big kind of neon plastic kind of molded objects and I couldn't afford one of those but also that direct relationship between you know my thought and my finger and then you know as I said the trapping of the carbon to form the text that direct relationship was very important so the proposals became a way a vehicle uh, a way of of sharing work um, but not taking ownership of work you know allowing the author or authors um, to uh, be part of the work and when I mean authors I mean readers you know other people being able to read that work and the work that we're going to discuss today the the work for the the UCAT which is the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust uh, that came out of a, a conversation I had with a curator called Sud Basu who contacted me and said would you be interested in in writing a group of proposals for UCAT and of course, immediately I said yes, because for me, this sort of mythical place, Antarctica, was sort of in my mind, you know, from when I was very young, thinking of um, reading National Geographics or other similar type magazines or watching nature programs about Antarctica, this kind of mythical place of kind of blank nothingness, emptiness, but yet in amongst all that, there's this sort of endless possibility, you know, the blank page, if you like. Um, but also the harshness of the environment too was really intriguing. And so the 60 proposals, as, as you can see, that came out of writing a writing period, which was the 1st of November to the 30th of November, 2019. So there's a very distinct um, uh, timeline that I'm, I'm working within, which then allows the work to develop. And sometimes I write more proposals and sometimes I write less depending on well, depending on the timeline, but then also depending on what I'm writing about. And Antarctica, I had notes for, a, um, well, originally I had notes for about a 330 different proposals, and then they get edited down and reduced down to what I hope it becomes a core group. And then from that core group of maybe 100, I then reduce that again um, in the writing. So, um, and I should say they're only ever written once. So, and I'm terribly dyslexic, so it, you know my spelling is terrible, my punctuation is terrible. But I hope that that comes across as instead of being sort of ham-fisted and um, wrong-footed, it comes across as being um, just honest. It's just the thing that it is. 
I think that's so significant, the honesty behind um, exactly what you just mentioned and the typewriter in general. Um, and you see that with different things today as well. Um, the computer, we can always go back and re-edit, whereas the typewriter, as you said, it's more permanent. People um, feeling nostalgia towards Polaroids, for example, rather than yeah, purchasing quite. a phone. And I think that sense of permanence really, um, really connects with the idea of Antarctica at large, if it's something permanent or not. Um, so that, that segues us into the next um, proposal, which I might mention at this point that we also had trouble <laughs> narrowing it down from the 60 proposals. So today we'll be looking at um, 10 to 15 proposals, just for everyone's, uh, for context. For sanity, perhaps, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, again, just to give a little bit of context, maybe, Peter, would you like to say something about um, yes. Port Lockroy? Yes, so this is Port Lockroy, which um, was first discovered, or at least was um, the sort of the bay that it's in was discovered in 1904 uh, by Edouard Lockroy, who uh, it's named after Edward Lockroy, actually. It's a French explorer who, who found it, but Edward Lockroy um, was a minister in the French government at the time. And... In 1904, it was just, it was a whaling community or post that it was whaling. Um, and then there was a lot of uh, ionospheric research done from this site. So the upper atmosphere and, um, and then in 1944, at the end of the second world war, there was a, a secret British um, army base that was set up here. And it was mad, that was manned and they carried on doing the research into the ionosphere and, and environmental issues until the early 60s, 1962. And then the, base was abandoned and then in 1996 um, I hope my, my memory serves me right um, it was opened as a museum and, and a post office and it's one of the um, there are more visitors to this this little pocket this little area in the archipelago or the or the sort of um, the land spit coming out from the, the if you look at Antarctica the, the top left of Antarctica than anywhere else so it's thank you there you go so Goodyear Island this is this Port Lockroy is this bay um, and yeah, you can see on the, the small uh, inset, you can see where that is on the, on the top part. So it's not in the, it's obviously it's part of the main landmass, but it's not what you would, you know, it's not anywhere near the, the South Pole, um, well, nearer, nearer than we both are perhaps, but, um, and so this post office became a sovereign space or place within uh, uh, Antarctica. And it's, it's the southerly most work, you know, southerly, um, so, southerly most working, uh, southerly, I can't get that, this out right, can I? It's a working post office, but it's the one that's further south, let's put it that way. Um, so it's something that, that intrigued me in terms of how, um, you know, in terms of the proposal, but then also in terms of the sort of abstract nature of what Antarctica is, it's all about these sort of uh, narratives and this sense of how we ex experience a place or places through um, well, through not being able to go there or in absence. And that was something that really intrigued me about this space and this place, which is looked one of seven sites looked after by the United Kingdom Antarctic Heritage Trust. And it was the one that I responded to the most strongly and had very sadly, had we not been through the pandemic and terrible um, uh, COVID pandemic we'd just had, then I would have gone there last October. Uh, so that would have been a trip that I would have made. Um, and the proposals, I should say, were, were written in celebration of 200 years of the, the discovery of, of Antarctica as a landmass. So it's, it's an interesting space, but again, it's, it's a visited space. So it's, a, it's, it's, very, it's very much of its own. I, 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 you know, thinking about a lot of the things I was listening to before from the scientists before of, of this difficulty of visiting a place like Antarctica in the current uh, climate crisis and, and going to these places, are we just, you know, perhaps me not going there is a good thing. You know, perhaps, it, you know, these works existing in, in isolation away from there and in the imagination is actually exactly how the work should re be realized, that they shouldn't be physical things or sculpture and some of the other projects we'll talk about as well. But the idea that, you know, this, this place should be a, a virgin territory. It shouldn't be a land grab. It couldn't, you know, shouldn't be a, 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 a land mass that, that people are um, not fighting over, but, or potentially fighting over, but um, trying to grab. And I think that the next piece that we'll look at in a minute, um, the next proposal leads very neatly into that. 
And I think that's um, such an interesting parallel. And we were discussing this earlier, but um, the concept of the unrealized proposal, the work that remains on the A4 sheet of paper mm -hmm. and how Antarctica um, is and will remain in most of our minds of the people who haven't visited as an imagined sort of place. Um, so leading on to the next proposal, um, tell us more about this. Tell us more about flags. Why so, a flag? Yeah, why a flag? Well, this work was actually made for a project uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in the Northern Netherlands in 2012. And it was a work that was revisited for Antarctica. And originally in, in 2012, it's in the North Netherlands and that's all reclaimed land. So land that was once part of the sea. And it seemed particularly appropriate for um, Antarctica. I should explain actually the flag itself, a white flag obviously is a flag of surrender, but also a flag of truth. So it's a, a flag to encourage conversation over conflict. Um, and the font itself is really important. I went through lots of different fonts, but this font was developed for Charles de Gaulle Airport as the wayfinding from everything from telling you where your plane is to, you know, where the chapel is or way out or taxis, that kind of thing. Um, and it's called Frutinger. So it was uh, it was designed for Charles de Gaulle Airport in the in the 60s. And Charles de Gaulle was bidding to be the European hub for the world. So if you flew to Europe, you'd fly to Charles de Gaulle first and then you'd go out, you know, you'd go out to the UK or to Germany or wherever. And so it seemed incredibly appropriate for, for a flag that was a greeting, you know, just to say hello, to be based in, you know, this, this font that was made for Europe or made for Europe facing out to the world. Um, and then I was thinking about what a flag is. What is a flag other than a greeting? And hello being the universal word that it is. Yes, it's an English word for, for hello, hello, how are you, you know? you know, hello, who's on the end of the phone, that kind of thing. It's just not, it's not just that, it's just, it is a universal greeting. It's, it's as widely used in Japan as it is in Germany or it is in South America, it's, it's known. And so for me, it was very interesting placing it on a white flag, you know, the flag of truce or the flag of parley, the, you know, conversation starter. And then starting that with hello was, was a really interesting um, placement, but then, within the context of Antarctica, it's even more interesting because, you know, thinking back to that map that we saw, there are lots of little islands, especially on the spit of land that goes up that sort of archipelago around um, those groups of islands that are constantly being, um, uh, having flags placed in them and flags flying. And I was speaking to someone at the British Antarctic uh, Survey and they say sometimes they go past a small island and one day it'll have a Russian flag and then the next day it'll have a an American flag and then the day after that it might be Norwegian or it might be a British flag and then the day after that so the idea that flags have a totally different significance in in Antarctica and and thinking also about that idea of how we um how we associate and and not just associate but then with for example a British flag or, or a, a Russian flag you know what do we associate with that and so to try and strip that away but still have something that is, you know, in terms of hello, this was also, this piece was also shown at the Edinburgh Festival um, 10 years ago or 11 years ago now. And then last year when the festival wasn't on because of the pandemic, they, they showed the flags again. And people had remembered the first time, although what I also like about these is they're in the periphery. They're not on a gallery wall. They're not on the side of a building. They are literally dependent on the wind. They're dependent on a natural occurrence you know cold air sinking hot air rising and it moving around the globe that's why these flags fly there's no other reason and so in that way that they are dependent on their location which obviously when they're in a location such as antarctica or port lockroy as the, as these are intended to be then it has a totally different context especially with the, you know that idea going back to the idea of planting a flag in a in an island just to claim it only for then for it to be counterclaimed within 24 hours or less. Yeah, absolutely. And since you mentioned um, history a little bit with Charles de Gaulle, um, what do you think the connection is now with uh, British history and British presence right now in Antarctica? What's my, well, I'd like to be more informed to answer that fully, I think. But on a peripheral, I think that both poles need protecting both. You know, the idea that we're doing enough is not, quite clearly not the case. And I think that each government around the world could actually do so much more than they're doing, you know, cutting emissions, all the things I could personally do more. You know, I could 
travel less, I could cycle more, you know, I could you know, take public transport more, I could, you know, all those things. And I think that that in itself is really an incredibly important part of everyone's processes and processing what's happening right now. And, you know, to think, you know, it was something that I was staggered by when I was researching these. And then it was in the sort of videos that segue between the conversations with everyone involved this afternoon, that 70% of the world's fresh water is trapped in ice in Antarctica. I was completely staggered by that. And that's 30 million cubic kilometers of ice. It's, it's staggering. And so if, if all that melts, I mean, I'm not saying I have no, I have no, no idea whether it will, but if all that melts and then the water around the world will rise by 70 meters. And that's just Antarctica. It's just staggering to me. It's at the time it was staggering and I still can't quite believe it. Now, when we were chatting earlier on, I just, it's, it's something about, there's something about Antarctica that does bring people together despite having not been there. It's a little bit like thinking about standing on top of, um, I don't know, the castle in Edinburgh or somewhere, an internationally well-known landmark, um, the Eiffel Tower in, in Paris. You know, there is a conception, that idea that you can think yourself onto a space or into a space. And I think Antarctica is also like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess then uh, such a flag is very fitting in connecting us all to Antarctica. It is, um, although I have to say- flag of truth and honesty and um, greeting. Yeah, absolutely. Although I have to say, had I known it was going to be flown in Antarctica, we would have picked, um, you yeah, know, we'd pick a different background because it's very grey and flat and often <laughs> very cold and not much, a great deal of wind. So, um, you know, it would be a different colour background perhaps, but but important for that work that it exists as, as it does. So moving on to the next one. Um, the post office on Port Lacroix, um, you said that um, you wanted to ship objects out without any packaging at all, um, and then also create a stamp. So I, I was curious to find out what you think the significance of material packaging is and of stamps and what that stamp would look like. Well, the stamp, I always thought that the stamp would be the hello flag flying in Port Lacroix, which I quite like, that mm -hmm. sort of meta reintroduction of of the work through the stamp and the objects I've been posting objects since I was 12 where I posted a piece of toast to my cousin and then it sort of it sort of continually um or continued from that point and the postal objects are very much about um the conversations that happen or the collaborations that happen between me and the postal service or other people in the you know between the studio and then um and then that work traveling through a system, an international system. There's an international postal agreement, which means that if I post something in the UK and it goes to Australia, for example, when it reaches the Australian border, then the Australian Postal Service are duty bound to uh, deliver that, that parcel. And in the same way, if something returns from Australia to the UK, to me, that the UK Post Office are then duty bound to um, uh, are duty bound to 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 deliver that to me or to to anyone else for that matter, and so the idea that the the postcards themselves or, or or the postal objects I should say sorry themselves can exist in you know they're all ready made objects they're all usually wooden objects sometimes plastic but often ready made objects for axes axe handled other 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 things and they're posted through that using that ser service to to make the work and it's that collaboration. Sometimes they're canceled by franking, you know, hand franking, and other times they're canceled by Sharpie. And the Sharpie drawings are very much like Cy Twombly's or they're just a really beautiful inter interaction with the work. And it's the conversations that happen and, and I've been fortunate enough to, to have with different postal workers when I've met them. And they said, oh, it's you. Oh, you've been sending these things. We've been seeing these through the the postal service so we've been seeing these coming through the sorting office for the last 15 20 years and we didn't know who'd been doing it yeah and the idea that they have a shelf that they they're destined to go to so if i send 10 objects if i sent you 10 objects mm -hmm. i would expect sort of 70 percent seven of those objects to arrive with you hopefully all 10 would but then others <laughs> go missing and so within yeah. that there is 
you know, the responsibility for the work isn't just solely with me. And that also echoes within the proposal as well. And equally, I suppose you could argue with, the, you know, the, the stewardship under our, in our lifetime of a place like Antarctica, it is, it's not just, you know, the, it's not just you and me, it is, it is everyone else, you know, and you and me. Yeah, um, I also think it's interesting that if you send um, a postcard from Post La Croix to Argentina and the UK, it will reach the UK before it reaches Argentina. Yes. Which is quite funny, distance-wise. Yeah, um, it is. I suppose one is the... Over the post office. Sorry, I spoke over... Sorry, I beg your pardon. What, what did you it? say? I, I, I just think it's very interesting as far as who has stewardship over Antarctica and the post office that if one were to send a postcard from uh, post Lockeroy to Argentina and the UK at the same time, it would reach the UK first. Uh, so I wonder if that's that's probably air routes, isn't it? I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> not entirely sure, actually, but it could be, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know, but it is interesting. And so, you know, it is, you know, those the ready made I mean, these are actually two different proposals that you've just put together on this single, cool. that PDF. And so that you know the this this the the stamp design was very much about that idea of you know and in terms of the language used it's quite a good example in a proposed design a stamp that we made available through the post office at Port Lockery that is as brief as it could probably get yeah. without naming or describing what that would look like but then equally that hopefully <clears throat> hopefully then gives others a way into you know investigating what they might do or think what I might do if they should be so you know have enough time on the hands. I think, yeah. I think that's of such great value uh, with some of these proposals, the fact that they're very brief, only a sentence long. Um, when I read it, I found myself thinking how, what stamp I would design, what stamp you were thinking of, and that's why I asked. Um, no, so they it definitely comes back to that idea. Really Sorry, go on. No, no, it's all right. I was just saying that they're definite, they definitely nurture one's imagination. Um, and thinking how it would actually materialize. I think that's also really important. And sometimes they mention, say, for example, the hello flag is a description of a flag, but it doesn't then describe the research that was made to find the best material or the best flags that I could find. And, you know, you'd think, oh, it's made of cotton, but actually it's made out of spun polyester, which doesn't fray in the same way. It does fray in the end, but it doesn't fray as quickly as cotton. Um, it's a really interesting, you know, the, the proposals themselves don't speak of how the work should be made, but they just describe the work. And in that way, it's a very much about inviting people into the process. It's not, it's not a given sculpture. It's not a given painting or a photograph or a performance, or it's a description of that. Mm -hmm. And in that you're, you're hopefully inviting others in. Yeah, uh, which really speaks to a proposal we'll get to in a little bit, but for yeah. the time being, um, this proposal about um, the dictionary definition of an echo. And again, it just as to everyone's individual interpretation of each proposal. For me, the question I thought of um, when, when reading this one is whether Antarctica is, is an echo itself or whether the world is an echo of Antarctica or um, just as far as which one is it? The last, um, is it the last one? The second definition, dictionary definition, whether both are echoes of each other. Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, the idea of, of placing these, especially uh, within uh, the, the buildings that are looked after by the Antarctic Heritage Trust, the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, was that a lot of these places are abandoned spaces. You know, Antarctica is a continually, as is obviously the rest of the world, continually developing place as far as its shifts and change. And, and so there is always that sense that there is always an echo somewhere. I mean, it's a little bit like cutting your finger and cutting it deeply enough that it marks you could have a small scar. Potentially that then is an echo of that cut, of that accident, of that knife as it slices through the tomato and too close to your forefinger. Maybe that's also an echo. It's also having that reflection, that ripple that you then look at that cut or that you look at that healed cut as a scar or as a little, you know, change in the shape of your finger and you remember the taste of a tomato. You don't necessarily remember just the cut. And so the echo in this case um, is very much about thinking 
beyond not just Antarctica and these buildings, but thinking about, you know, what we have not just in common with these places or spaces, but also what is different. So the idea that the dictionary definition is there, that is just a single, actually that's two different dictionaries. That's Webster's, which is American English dictionary. And it's also the Oxford English dictionary as well. Um, and they're from different times or amalgamations of a, the Oxford English dictionary. The definition of an echo is pretty consistent, but the one in Webster changes slightly over sort of 50 years. I have a collection of dictionaries in the studio that I can cross reference the changing descriptions or definitions of words, which is, you know, potentially, um, yeah, potentially interesting to me anyway, maybe not to anyone else, but um, the idea that an echo is something that reflects off something, I think is very important, which in terms of, the proposal is very much what I'm intending them to do, that it is a reflection of the reader rather than solely just me. You know, the, the beginning, the sound, the, you know, the, the, the text is very much about, you know, my interpretation of a work that I imagine, but equally then in, in its reading, as we were saying, it becomes the interpretation of the reader. So in that way, it's, it's a very, and potentially, hopefully, anyway, <laughs> it's a very different way of looking at work. So just in this single proposal, um, it has it's you know it's 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 not it's not a brilliant white neon it's not a neon installed in antarctica and these buildings it's it's just not that it's just a description but in that it doesn't mean that it can't exist and won't exist you know it's it is it is what it says it is it's just doesn't yet formally have a relationship with a space yeah. you know the space yeah. that it has a formal relationship with is in your mind and and that is for me personally that's what's really interesting is that it has an infinite in infinite possibility of how then it could be interpreted or, or looked at. Yeah, it, in this interpretation, everything becomes an echo. Yeah, a reflection of uh, the person interpreting it. Um, so this proposal, um, could you tell us more about um, this book? Yes, yeah, so I actually have, um, I have a copy here. So the books are, this is uh, the 34th and I'm soon to make the 35th in a series. And they're all, so the, the color of the book and the font, the font is from a, um, a British Antarctic survey, survey, uh, hand survey of um, Antarctica and Port Lockroy and the area around Port Lockroy. And the color of the book was from a 1965 a report to president, now, who was the president? Good grief, my mind's gone. Do you remember who the president was in 1965 in America? Anyway, it's the first, that's terrible. I mean, we'll probably get loads of messages about that. My mind's gone completely blank. I should have had a coffee just before we came on instead of half an hour before, but um, I can see his face and his name's gone out my he head. Anyway, that, that's the color of the, the, the file that was given to him. And it's the first governmental report on climate change. Well, so the okay. color of the book, that is where the color of the book comes from. It's a, it's, it's sort of a pistachio green. Um, so the book itself is, is very much about obviously sharing the proposals, the proposals in their original form as type proposals exist as a single work. But then this book, um, I can't remember how many this was produced actually. This was printed in an edition of 500. So once, you know, once these books are out there and exist out there in the world, they, you know, again, they're interpreted by others, you know, so sometimes I've seen them, you know, I go around to friends' houses or people I've not met and they've got, oh, I've got one of your books. Can you tell me about this book? And actually, when you get into the conversation, it's very much like the conversation we've heard in that it describes the work, but it's not the work. And yeah. in that way, it's, it's, a, it's about inviting those others in again, going back to that idea and a book in its, in its basic form has been a way that we've been able to share information for you know, three, 500 years. Mm 